Brandon, welcome to the podcast. How are you, my friend? I'm feeling good. Thanks for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure, mate. And uh, we obviously saw the uh, the recent announcement that you're going to be announcing on uh, the Craig Jones Invitational. That's true. I'm super excited about it. It's a crazy, it's just a crazy time to be in the sport. Yeah, it's, it's definitely mad times. How did that come about? Um, well, Craig just had reached out to me and then um, I wasn't sure if I was going to be doing the ADCC. I, I did it last time. And I, I wasn't sure how that was going. And then I just had not heard from anybody. And uh, so I was like, yeah, I think I, I think I can do CJI. And, and I like what <laughs> Craig is trying to do. You know what I mean? So, yeah, yeah I'm just super cool, happy to be involved. You know, for, for all his craziness, for all his antics, like he, he is trying to do something really important for the sport. And, and I think he's succeeding with that. And so... My hat's off to him in that regard. I hate that the him and ADCC got a beef, but because uh, I, I really love ADCC too is the thing. They've been really good to me. I've always uh, had good experiences with them. But I'm not an I'm not an athlete. I'm just kind of working on the media side of things. But I've always had a really pleasant experience with ADCC. But a million dollars, dude. Mm -hmm. Like this Although, is a uh, monumental moment for the sport, and uh, it's going to be. I feel super honored like to be just a small part of it, to be honest with you. Yeah, I think they're going to be uh, trying to rip lim limbs off for a million, aren't they? It's going to be a Man, really they good competition. Man, they might. I, <laughs> I don't know. I think I'd just let it go. I don't think I, I want the million that bad. I'm trying, to walk, <laughs> I'm trying to walk tomorrow. I'm a little too old for that game. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it looks like it's going to be awesome. Um, initially, it was one of these things where I was – been looking forward to ADCC for well two years and yeah same then this popped up and started stripping away some of the athletes and initially I was a bit like oh Craig you've ruined it but I think it's now created two amazing events that weekend and I absolutely see what he's trying to do here he's doing it for a good cause isn't he I think it'll benefit the sport massively over time I think that's an important part of it and man I, I just think that the main thing he's trying to do is just push the sport into a direction where the athletes are put first always. Yeah. And dude, I respect that. Like you, there's a lot of different ways to go about that, you know, <laughs> and he's taking the tack that he's taken, but it's working out pretty well. Like as far as bringing in publicity and bringing in eyeballs. So yeah, I mean, he, he's doing a great job. Hey guys, just letting you know that we recently launched our new everyday black belt membership on Patreon. This gives you access to our exclusive community where together we decide what future guests we're going to have on the podcast and what questions we're going to ask them. You also get exclusive content as well as early ad-free access to all of our episodes. So if you love what we do, don't spend 10 years getting a black belt. For the price of a coffee a month, get one now. It helps us, it supports the channel and it helps us bring you better guests. I think regular people now, like people who are not even into jiu-jitsu, know kind of who Craig Jones is, what he's doing. He's been on Joe Rogan. He's going on these podcasts. He's talking about it. You know, there's a few of my mates now know who Craig Jones is where they didn't have any clue about any jiu-jitsu guys before. So I think that's a big difference. You know what I think really is, is going on here is we have one organization that wants to be the world championships. That's ADCC. That's the world championships. The idea is to find out who the best guy is at this rule set that's been determined to be by the community for whatever reason. That's the rule set that if you're the champion of that rule set, you're the man. That's the world champion. But then you've got another organization over here, and their objective is prize fighting. And these are two very different objectives. Like Jake Paul is absolutely not the best boxer in the world. But he might be the best prize fighter on the planet. Yeah. And these are two different things. One is a potential career path, and one is a, a glory path. And I believe there's room for both of those things to coexist. And and I think that that's what's happening. And the jujitsu community is growing from it. We we need the good guy bad guy narrative. We're very simple people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah i can agree more. yeah yeah i absolutely love it do you think um cji is is going to stick around or do you think it's it's like a one-off like protest uh, to get to to get some movement in the in the sport or do you think there's going to be future events what's your feel of it all all indications seem to be that it's gonna it's gonna be a thing so i mean you <laughs> know i'm not at the top of the inside of the organization by any stretch 
but I've been in some meetings and talked to some folks. I think he's going to, I think it's going to go pretty well, man. I think people are going to be pleasantly surprised with what it turns into. I think there's a world on the other side of this initial conflict between ADCC and CJI where they both exist and are both better than they were before the whole fiasco. And I think that that is the world that we're going to find ourselves in 12 months from now. Imagine grapplers every year being able to fight for a million. That's a game yeah. changer, isn't it, for everyone. To, hey, you know, everyone. Listen, everybody keeps saying a million. It's a million to two different divisions. Yeah. Two different guys are going to get a million. Not, yeah. a, not a guy. Two different guys are getting a million. Biggest super fight in the hi- biggest match in the history of women's jujitsu. You got the reigning ADCC champion taking on the goat of her era, ADCC champion. Went off to fight MMA, improve her jujitsu, and try to make some money. And then the sport grew while she was gone. And she said, Hey, maybe I could ply my trade back over there again. Maybe I'm still the best, but we get to find out. Dude, biggest female matchup of all time. I can't, I can't wait for that match. I'm as excited yes. about that as I am the minus 80 kilo division, which I think could be the best bracket ever assembled. Yeah, it's looking good. But yeah, I agree that, that that super fight is excellent as well. I think it's going to be awesome. Brandon, I wanted to talk to you about the rule set because I think I heard you explaining this a little on another podcast or on another show. Um, and I know there's uh, still a little bit of, not confusion, but uncertainty around how the rule set kind of uh, is structured and how and who it benefits and I, I heard you talking about this and wondered if you would be so kind to share it again um, on, on our show just in regard to the rule set and who you think that would benefit looking at the athletes so it's a very unique rule set it's not unheard of but the 10 point must system being a part of it is kind of unheard of for grappling I, I can't actually think of a promotion that's done it that way before but the basics is this they're going to run rounds so basically you're going to get three five minute rounds And each round is going to be scored 10 points to the winner, nine or less to the loser. So the same mechanism that they use in boxing and in professional MMA to score the 10-point must system, same kind of mechanism. And the number one criteria is initiating action. And I think that that's – with those two things combined, I think that we're setting up a a situation where wrestlers are going to be able to come in and do better than people think. And I think that that's super cool. I think that's super cool. I love that w- that we've got a rule set that gives a, these guys a chance to do what they do. Mm. So if these wrestlers like Kirk Vleet, Jason Knopf, some of these guys can stay out of the leg entanglements and stay out of these these dangerous positions in the lower body with these people who are experts at ripping knees, if they can stay out of those positions, then I think that they're going to have a good chance to win some of these matches just on uh, taking two rounds. Yeah, and I think I heard you talking about how the um, how the third round is quite crucial as well, right? The third, yeah. So let's say me and you are in a scrap. You take round one. I take round two. You take round three. That obviously is going to be two to one for you. But like, let's say we're in a situation where there was a point deduction in some way. And now it's tied up at the end of three rounds, even though you won the third round. Because you won the third round, you would get the victory. So the person who wins the last round in the case of a draw gets the win. That's really cool. That is really cool. They're yeah. going to have to push it. I probably it, didn't like... do a great job of explaining it. Like it. It's really simple. If it's tied, whoever won the last round wins. Yeah. I probably shouldn't say so many words sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's absolutely fine. I got you, man. Yeah. So I guess, I guess, uh, is there going to be 10 eights and that sort of thing, do you know? It, yeah, potentially 10 eight, even okay. they listed a potential 10 seven, but yeah. you know, nobody's ever done this before. So who knows what the scoring is going to be like? Who knows who the judges are? I don't, we don't have any of that information yet. Yeah. Okay. Dude, uh, if he brings in Cecil peoples, we're going to have to have a discussion. <laughs> <laughs> Cecil always gets a bad rap, dude. Cecil Peoples always gets the bad rap. I think it's, uh, yeah, it's going to make for some really good action, isn't it? I think it's going to be, yeah, a bit of a spectacle. How do you think the uh, the kind of pit or the alley um, kind of plays a role? Do you think that's, uh, again, I guess, it's a like huge factor. The, yeah. How do you think that's going to change things? I just got to go to Karate Combat this past weekend up in Nashville, Tennessee. Mm-hmm. And uh, we got invited over, me and Keelan, 
our, took our wives over, you know what I'm saying? We had a great time. They were super nice to us, super good to us. But after the show, I got my uh, broadcast partner for CJI, Josh Palmer. He's like, come on, let's get down in the pit. You've got to see like how steep it actually is. I really think after spending a little, especially after spending a little bit of time in there, just trying to like move around and like scrap around with Josh a little bit so we could get a feel for it. I think if you're not training on that slanted wall, you're going to be at a disadvantage. I think the guy, are, I think the guys who are getting to train on a slanted wall are going to know some things you don't know. Mm. I, I didn't realize how steep it was. Like, it's just it's 45 degrees, but you don't really think about how steep 45 degrees is. There's no standing up off of that. Yeah. There's, you're not going to just stand up off of it. You're also not going to be able to be backed up into it. Like in MMA, I would back you all the way up against that flat cage, and then I'd be able to shoot in on your hips or circle for underhooks or whatever, but I'd be able to stop your backwards momentum to make my entry. That's not going to happen. Like there's no wall to stop on. You just fall. But now you're grappling at a different angle with different, like gravity's working on this situation differently. And so th there's going to be things that you can and can't do with the angled wall that if you're not training with it, you're not going to realize it yet. So I think if the, the alley is something that gets adopted, I think that that's going to turn into our version of, of wall fighting in MMA, mm -hmm. where it's mm -hmm. going to have to become its own discipline in some ways how cool would that be, That'd be yeah so I, it's a it. it's a super interesting meta I, i'm interested to see how it plays out well we obviously saw craig himself obviously <laughs> utilize that that in the pit right yeah so, and, and made such a cool highlight you yeah, know what i mean like it just it. <laughs> so much more potential since the fight's not stopping at the edge of the mat mm. you know like there's so much more potential for something cool to happen in a moment like that. I think I think that's the most frustrating thing when I watch jiu-jitsu is resetting constantly. Reset, reset. You know, you're on the edge of the mat, reset, reset. I think it's fucking hell, like, it's just too much. Whereas, like, this now, it's, it's got to be nonstop action. There's nowhere to go. There's nowhere to reset. It's got to be no breaks. It's just got to be a lot more intense, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I, I just can't think of another way to solve the resets problem like in a clean way I, I mean we're, we're working on some stuff with the pgf but we we don't want to go to the pit just because of the live viewing experience is kind of what we settled on because it is hard to see down inside the pit unless you're sitting like at the edge of it yeah you know what i'm saying so yeah, yeah. um but that makes a great tv product like karate combat has probably one of the coolest streaming promotions that you could watch like it's unbelievable some of the stuff they do like they're mind-boggling but if you're and then if you're live sitting on the edge of the pit yo what an incredible experience but everybody else is having to like look down into it and so there's always like a little spot of the map that you can't exactly see without looking at the screens oh that's gonna be good brandon are you um in a position to to sort of make predictions at this point have you got any thoughts about who takes the the, the two categories obviously Craig and Gabby, and then obviously the the ladies' fight as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll say that I'm for the ladies' fight. I believe that Fiona is just the cream of the crop. Uh, I do believe that Mackenzie is very good. I think she might do better than people expect, but um, Fiona's at the cutting edge of the sport right now. I don't see any way that any woman in the world beats her right now. So yeah, I think that's um, even though Mackenzie's incredible and I'm a giant fan, I think it's a pretty easy call. Maybe it won't be a blowout, but I think Fionn will will have a convincing victory. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that. Gabby and Craig. <laughs> Gabby and Craig, I mean, dude. You want my real prediction? <laughs> you want me to say something? <laughs> yes, <crazy>? please. <laughs> I mean, Craig's gonna win, right? Craig's gonna win. He's gonna leg locker whenever he wants. <laughs> How about the under eighty? Under eighty like I said earlier, probably one of the strongest brackets ever assembled at any weight class in any promotion. It's hard to call the under 80 because I do think there are probably six guys in this thing that could win it. Yeah. But so good, I got to go with Ty Rotolo as my top seed. If somebody besides Ty wins, that would surprise me a little bit. 
but I could also see a world where Cade wins and I could see a world where uh, Roberto Jimenez wins as well. Yeah. So I don't think, and, and then there's, man, there's other bangers in there. Like mm -hmm. it's a, it's a crazy bracket, but those have got to be my top three seeds for sure. And the over 80, I think it really comes down to, especially with Mason having withdrawn, the over 80 is really just a, a two-man game the way I see it. It's Victor Hugo or it's Nicky Rodriguez. And I think a lot of that's going to depend on the way that the rules play out. Like I can see uh, – even though Victor beat him last time, and, and if I was putting money down, I would probably put my money on Hugo. Mm -hmm. But I think if the rules may favor Nicky Rod a little more for this particular matchup. So we will see. Uh, but for me, that's a two-man game. I can see it going Nicky Rod or Victor Hugo. If you're forcing my hand, I'll say Victor Hugo. Yeah, I think we're probably uh, with you on that, to be fair, mate. I think with the with the under 80s, I think just what you were saying about the rule set and and how they're scoring the rounds, I think the the brothers it's going to benefit them just because of how aggressive they are with their style as well, right? Yeah, and, and you know I think uh, while we're talking about brothers, let me talk about Andrew Tackett in that oh, minus mate. 80. Yeah. Um, I think everybody may be sleeping on him. You know, I I I may be even was sleeping on him when I just named three earlier. I would. I would like to revise that and put Andrew Tackett in and say it's a four man game right there. Uh, I it's think Tackett could win it. it. I think he could win it. I really do. I, I know that's kind of crazy. That's a that's a bit of a dark horse pick, but I think that kid is special, and I think his jujitsu and his pacing, it is just it's right up there with the best in the world, including Cade and Ty. Ty is a little bigger than than uh, Cade. And Ty is a little bigger than Andrew. And then I feel like Roberto is a little bit bigger than Ty. So I think that's going to come into play as well because it is such a large weight class. There, there are people represented from multiple weight classes. So I think that could end up playing a small factor, but I don't think it's going to be a huge factor. So, so I can't wait. I'm just looking forward to it. Yeah, I guess obviously with you uh, you working the event, you're going to struggle to have your own ADCC a little bit as well. But any anybody kind of uh, across the uh, across the road in in ADCC that you're you kind of excited to see compete? Oh uh, yeah, dude, that 66 kilogram division at ADCC looks. You know, I said the minus 80 at CJI might be one of the best brackets of all time. This minus 66 at ADCC is also one of the best brackets of all time. I think it's the second best bracket on the weekend. I could see the argument that it's the best bracket on the weekend because the 66 really didn't lose anybody to the CJI debacle. They, their division is intact, and so all the best in the world are right there in that division just like they always were. And it also happens to be one of the most exciting divisions in grappling. You know, I would make the argument 77 is the best division, but now I got to say that 66 has everybody in it. So that's the, that's the bracket for ADCC for sure. I uh, can't wait to see Pato. I feel like he's been on fire right now. I think I like Pato to win that bracket. Um, Baby Shark, of course, phenomenal. There's a, there's a lot of killers in there, dude. That's going to be a, ki a killer bracket so yeah i'm super excited to see that uh, and i'm looking i'm looking at pato as my 66 champion i think yeah we've obviously got our boy owen jones in there who won the european oh, trials hey listen owen's a serious deal mm, the kid's yeah, no joke we'll, we'll see you know he's he's flirted with the top of the sport right so and he and he looks like he can hang so we'll see this will be his first chance to really show it He's so young as well, mate. He's like 19, isn't he? Yeah, he looks like he's 12 years old. <laughs> <laughs> he's a little assassin, mate. It's like, who's Pop this little green belt like coming in here strangling <laughs> all these Americans, man? Get this kid out of here. No, he, he's yeah. phenomenal, and he's fun to watch. Yeah, and, no, he's you know, a really he's, good lad. You know, he's got a good – he's marketable. Like, he's a potential star because he's fun. He's, he's fun to follow. He's exciting. He's a winner, young, not shy in front of the camera. He's going to do well. Like if he can come out and have a big showing at ADCC, it's going to even if he just does really well. It, it, maybe he doesn't even make the final four. But if he does really well, you know, has a great showing, wins his first match, great showing against a legend in round 2, he's going to have a it's going to be something that propels him towards success if that's what he wants. 
he's only got to get better, isn't he? You know, he's not exactly. He's bro. only got to get better. You know, so you see him in three or four years or whatever. He's not in a black belt yet. Is he? If you want to be a professional, what can you do? Okay, you got the eyeballs. Everybody looked. Everybody saw. Now, what can you do? That's what separates the amateurs from the pros. What do you make of, um, of of obviously Gordon? I think last time I looked, he was doing his division and I think the super fights as well. So. So two big super fights, and obviously his, his his health obviously is a bit unpredictable. And we talked previously on a, on a podcast where, you know, we were wondering this could be his last, you know, his last rodeo, so to speak. What do you think? I mean, maybe it will. I hope not. I, for my money, and I don't think it's close. I think Gordon is the best jujitsu player that we have on the planet right now. Very strong arguments that he's the best that's ever done it. And I hope we haven't seen the last of Gordon. I wish that dude tremendous health. And I, I like watching the best do what they do. And so every time Gordon steps out on the mat, it's a treat as a, somebody who loves jujitsu. You know what I'm saying? And you can think whatever you want about his online persona or his political views or all the madness that he brings to the table. But you, what you can't question is – is he the best in the world? He's the best in the world, dude. So yeah, I want to see the best in the world do his thing in just about any context. I'm interested in watching. He's still so young as well, really, to retire. You know what I mean? What's he now? He's not in 30, is he? Uh, no, I don't believe he's 30 yet. That's what I mean. He's so, still so young. He's still got so many years left if he can sort his health out. I think that the danger is always that he goes in undersized, you know, maybe struggling with his health, fatigued, and and takes a loss when I he should have. When he should have. I, yeah. I think he's. I think he's so far ahead of most of the heavyweights technically. Yeah. That that doesn't matter. He's got a lot to a lot of like slack that he can give. <laughs> yeah. I really think so. Now you can't say he's like Mika Galval. You can make good arguments for him being the best in the world right now, but. Mm -hmm. Just nobody has the resume that Gordon has. Like when you look at Mika with the eyeball test, you're like, ooh, he looks pretty good, you know. But <laughs> just Gordon's resume is just so much stronger, you know. You always feel Gordon has more in the tank, even though, we, you know, he just beat Josh I know, Saunders. And I know. it's like that, he plays with these top guys and just submits them at will. And it's just such a – it's so cool to watch. And you just never feel like he's fully trying, do you? You know what I mean? You never feel like he's 100% exhausted – Really cool. I've never seen anymore. him grimace, I don't think. No. <laughs> like, well, what's crazy is, you know, he, he came up on the scene and everybody's like, oh, the Donaher guys, the leg locks. And that's true. But what he built after he got to a spot where he could just beat anybody with leg locks, what he built his jujitsu into is a jujitsu that anybody can have because it is simple and efficient and fundamental and it doesn't require a ton of cardio. He built the most elite jujitsu we have in the sport out of the most simple jujitsu that we have in the sport. <laughs> yeah. And I just think that watching him do jujitsu is just, it's like watching on somebody paint a masterpiece. So true. Like you, you watch him sometimes, you pin in someone, and you know how hard it is, it's slippery, whatever. And he just makes it look effortless. And he's got these top pros just, just pinned and they can't move. And I'm like, the fuck can he just keep him there? Just so easy. Just just without even kind of breaking a sweat, like you said. Yeah, it's awesome, man. And uh, what are we, like, th two, three weeks away? Yeah, three weeks. Yeah, I can't wait. Yeah, it's coming <laughs> It's going to be a good weekend. It's coming up. Yeah. It's awesome. Uh, Brandon, obviously, people will know you from your social media, from your commentary. Um, obviously, you're a coach and a black belt as well. Um, we just were quite interested, mate, to go back to the beginning and your, your kind of jiu-jitsu journey. Obviously, you're a black belt under Eddie. Tell us about when you when you originally found jiu-jitsu and like your first impressions of, of Eddie and, and how it all started for you. So I started jiu-jitsu. My wife and I started at the same time. Um, I was just kind of like getting out of shape. And she was like, yo, we got to do something. I'm signing us up for martial arts. Because I wasn't going to run. I wasn't going to go to the gym. And so she's like, well, let's try martial arts together. And so we did. And we just stuck with it. The art that we started with is called Tung Su Do. It's you know, it's it's a lot like Taekwondo, but it's just what you'd think of as a traditional martial art. But we had a great time, and we were really lucky to have uh, a, a teacher in that art named Jamie Webster, who I think is just one of the most phenomenal martial artists that's ever lived. 
and he's super open minded. So we were going to his train at his place and working on our Tung Su Do, right, as our as our martial art that we're getting ranked in. But Jamie loves martial arts. So he's exposing us to oh, you should do a little bit of boxing. Oh, you should do a little bit of kung fu. Oh, you should learn how to run a bow staff. Like he he's just show he loves martial arts. So he's just showing us all the little parts and be like, do you like this part? And then when you grab something, be like, ooh, I like that. He's like, run, run, run. Learn as much as you can. You know, and so the thing that he exposed me to that I just fell in love with was grappling. I was like, oh man, I got to know as much as I can. And uh, and so I just started digging down this crazy rabbit hole. I met Eddie at a seminar like six months into my martial arts journey. And that's how I started getting obsessed with jujitsu is uh, – I just kind of on accident went to a seminar of his, not really knowing what I was walking into. Mm -hmm. And he was like drilling with me at, during the seminar, like trying to show me something. And I just remember he put these big paws on me. Like, oh my God, I didn't even know you could hold somebody like that. You know? And I was like, I have to know everything this dude knows. <laughs> and so I just got obsessed and I started traveling back and forth to LA when I could afford, when I could raise enough, like save enough money to be able to afford to go out there and stay for a little while. And I would drive on the weekends. If Eddie was close enough for me to drive, then I would just drive and go learn and train with him at a sem the seminar he's teaching in Springfield, Missouri or whatever. Yeah, that's awesome. And that, that first, those first six months before you met Eddie, was that, was that gi or no gi jiu-jitsu? Um, well, we did MMA classes okay. right away. Like that was yeah. that was one of the offerings on Saturdays. He had uh, we didn't he didn't call it MMA. He called it NHB classes. So he had NHB classes, Valley Tudo, they would call it, you know. And so we would just go up there and do that. So that part was always no gi, right? But when we were grappling during the week in class, so like he would have us grapple for fifteen minutes, even at the end of Tung Sudo class. And that would always be in our in our traditional like karate uniforms, not even like what you think of as a judo or jujitsu gi. Just like those little paper karate uniforms. Oh yeah. <laughs> you could strangle somebody for real with one of those. Yeah. I feel like one of those little uh, those little they, ninja they just wires, tear. wouldn't it? <laughs> they just they tear like paper. That's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. And then um, obviously when you met Eddie, he's obviously beyond like his jujitsu, he's obviously quite a character. Like like what was your impression of him as a guy? You know, did he, did he kind of capture you just with his aura as well as his jujitsu? Well, so especially at this time in our lives, me and Eddie were very, very different people. We come from totally different backgrounds. You know, we have totally different interests. And so, um, you know, our, over the years of building a friendship and a relationship from uh, student to teacher, uh, it's – we're we're a lot more alike than we ever would have thought, I'm sure. But yeah, we're super different. So to me, he was just like this crazy, quirky dude that knew this insane skill set that I had to that I had to master. And yeah, along the way, you learn all kinds of crazy stuff about Eddie. And <laughs> and what you what you really learn about Eddie along the way is that he's the most open minded, giving person that you're going to come across. Like, you know how some people, they believe like there's like the idea of scarcity and then there's the idea of abundance. Right. Mm -hmm. And a lot of people operate out of scarcity, but they talk about operating out of abundance or they believe in operating out of abundance, but don't truly do that. But Eddie really is the only guy that I've ever known who truly to his bone believes that there's enough for everybody to win. And so that's been really good for me to be around a guy like that who really thinks like that. And it's, it's helped me to become more like that over the years as well. And so, yeah, I'm super thankful for Eddie's friendship. He's been awesome. Yeah. Amazing. And specifically to jujitsu or martial arts, anything that really kind of stood out and that you took away over the years from your friendship with him. So I'll tell you this story is, uh, so Eddie used to put all his roles, all his rounds of rolling you could just get on his website and you could just watch him roll. You know what I mean? Like not everybody was doing that. And he would teach his client, he would teach and put his materials up so you could study his classes and his techniques. But then you can also just watch him roll on the videos. And I remember when I was a purple belt in my mind, 
at this time, Eddie is untouchable, right? I've never even gotten close at, you know what I'm saying? Like to getting a good position on him, it feels like at that point. (laughs) And so in my mind, Eddie is like this jujitsu demigod, you know what I'm saying? And I'm watching uh, his rolling footage and in the video, he's rolling with this big dude, real big guy, with like heavyweight versus Eddie, probably like 160, you know what I mean? And the guy taps Eddie. And I was like, what just happened? What is this? Oh, my God. And then they just slap and bump and they keep rolling. And then if I remember correctly, he taps him again at the end of the video. And then the video just ends. And then that's the end of the video. Like, and I remember just this sense of relief that I felt come over me because Eddie didn't mind losing and tapping and training so much so that he didn't care who saw it. And he, and matter of fact, he didn't even make a big deal about it. It just, it was right there in the footage. Yeah. I, I mean, like he didn't even consider it for a moment that it was going to be something that, that was bad for his ego. He's just like, look, here's some of my training footage. And that was such a sense of like relief for me that I don't have to be perfect all the time and that I can just get out and train and enjoy trying to get better, even if it doesn't always go my way. Like it was just such a a sense of freedom that I remember feeling. And yeah, that's been probably the biggest lesson that Eddie has taught me about training that he did that without really showing me anything just by doing what he does. Yeah. It must be really liberating. I think to see that, right? Yeah. Well, I thought, I thought there was no way people ever tap Eddie, no way Eddie would give up a a position and it wasn't even a big deal to him. And I think, I think that fear could stifle your learning so much, right? I think if you're, if you're worried about losing, yeah, and you're not going to allow sort of uh, certain positions and that type of thing. So yeah, that's uh, that's really cool. And obviously, Tenth Planet Jiu Jitsu were kind of very early adopters and kind of pioneers in Nogi Jiu Jitsu, right? Yeah, for sure. So back when you know people were still training in the gi all the time, or at the very least doing uh, a bit of both. Obviously, Eddie, I still remember him back in my early days of Jiu Jitsu when he was, you know, they always get stick because they never wore the gi. <laughs> But here we are, 2024, and like no gi is now what feels like the future of jiu-jitsu. Do you feel like the, the current sort of no gi style of jiu-jitsu is, is similar to, to that of 10th Planet, or has it kind of evolved again into something else? And, and do you think like the gi at a professional level is, is kind of just a non-starter these days now? Um, I, well, I think what we're going to see is that the sport really – instead of dividing across gi and no gi lines, I think it's going to divide across professional and amateur lines. And I think that just by the way that the, um, I guess the system of jujitsu is set up, like the pipeline is set up where you come up as a kid, you start training in the gi, you put on the gi, you go through the IBJJF system of, this is just like a regular person that wants to compete, right? And so, I think because all the regular people that just want to go try it and go compete mostly come up in the gi, I don't think that that's going to change. But I think that that pipeline lends itself towards being the amateurs. And I think that we've already seen that start to play out, right? And because no gi is a less traditional route, I think that that offers a lot more freedom in how it how it can be presented, how it can be expressed, both as a, um, a martial art and as a commercial product. And so I think that that allows for more sponsorship money, more investors, things like that to roll into Nogi. And so it has now, I believe, divided into professional and amateur, where Nogi is professional and Gi is amateur. And I don't mean that in terms of what's better or worse or who's better at jujitsu than the other. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying as a commercial product, as something that we're, we're putting out there as this is the sport. Because obviously you go win IBJJF Worlds in the Gi at Black Belt Adult Division, yo, you're one of the best 
practitioners on the face of the planet, gi or no gi. Like, I get it. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm just talking about the the sport itself, not the level of the practitioners. So I think it's gi profession or gi amateur, no gi professional. Yeah, that's a really good way of putting it, isn't it? Because I know <clears throat> when I spoke to Owen about it, he loves uh, gi. A lot of people love gi. Gi's fine, dude. But he he was like. I can go to gi tournaments, lose to some Brazilian that no one really knows. And then I get no notoriety. He said, but in the no gi, if I beat one good person, it's like you move up to their level. Then I get so many more opportunities. And and then, yeah, well, that's pretty much what he's done. He's just switched out of the gi just, just because of that. Like what you said, because he's turned effectively pro. There's a yeah potential career path in no gi right now. Yeah. And, and that just, that as much as the gi is cool and as much as, People love the gi and respect it. That just doesn't exist in the gi pipeline right now. Why do you think the, the, the gi never sort of took off as a professional um, spectacle? Do you think it's just because it's it's slower and it's harder for the, I guess, the non-judicial practi- practitioner to, to understand and watch? I think that's uh, a big part of it. Mm. But I also think that it's because it's so closely aligned to traditional martial arts, there's less people willing to take risk with it and alter it and change it into a viewer friendly format. Yeah. And so I think a little bit of it's the mindset and I'm not, again, I'm not saying right or wrong, just saying that seems to be a little bit about what's going on. And then just the nature of the thing itself, the subtleties of the gripping or the off balancing that can be done with the gi can make it hard to see what's actually happening, especially to the untrained eye, e- even sometimes to the trained eye, you know. And then just the speed of it in general <laughs> is it's slow. And, and and the rule set doesn't really the traditional rule set doesn't incentivize good behavior like it doesn't reward exciting behavior it penalizes negative behavior but it doesn't reward exciting behavior and so i i think yeah it's just it's harder to watch just it all boils down to it's just harder to watch yeah that's fair and 10th planet jiu-jitsu do you still think that differentiates from a lot of other sort of no gi jiu-jitsu styles? Obviously, there's I've never studied Tenth Planet, but I know there's obviously the, the various positions and obviously Eddie's cool names and his wizardry <laughs> and stuff. As as a as a black belt in Tenth Planet, do you think there is a difference still between that style and and other grappling styles, or is it all just ultimately the same thing? Well, I think any even within Tenth Planet, you've got a bunch of different styles of Tenth Planet because yeah, okay. we're spread out all over the country. And we're and so one of the cool things about Tenth Planet is that there is no gospel. There's no technique book that says this is Tenth Planet. Tenth Planet gospel is an open mind, not the lockdown, right? And so because of that, <laughs> because of that, the San Francisco crew and those four g- gyms over there, however many it is, four gyms in that San Francisco area, they got a certain flavor, and the LA gyms have got a certain flavor. And the Austin gym's got a certain flavor. And Seattle's got a different flavor. You get what I'm saying? The 10th Planet Decatur got a totally different flavor than any of those guys. And so Atlanta, same thing. Like there's a lot of like different styles of 10th Planet all within the 10th Planet thing because Eddie's not asking us to adhere to a particular ideology. He's saying if it works, it's good. Go and go and run it. If it if it works, just promise me you find something cool, you'll come back and teach me. Yeah, that's his that. that's his outlook. And so do I think the Tenth Planet style works? I think some of the Tenth Planet guys have proved that they can take it all the way to the top. PJ Barch beat JT Torres at ADCC, finished in the final four. Thor's been in the final four. Vinny Magalesh, whether you want to claim him as Tenth Planet or not, he claims himself as Tenth Planet. He's got a gold medal that he used rubber guard to win with, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Elu's got a couple of bronze medals, I think, in ADCC. So, uh, what did I say? Yeah, Thor went to day two. PJ goes to day two. Geo goes to day two. So, I think, you know, we haven't had that person rise up as ADCC gold medalist yet. 
But I think we got people just knocking on the door like a, mm-hmm. and a lot of those guys have a, a way different style. Like Alan Sanchez and PJ Barch have a totally different style, you know? So yeah, I think a lot of different, a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Yeah, I love I love Tenth Planet stuff. I watch your videos, got, well, quite a lot. <laughs> your uh, your lockdown electric chair stuff, I, I pretty much use most days. <laughs> <laughs> Be nice. He's a he's a blue belt now, but he was that annoying white belt that was just subbing like every everybody, regardless of their belt, with that with that fucking shit. You know what, dude? He sounds like a white belt right off the bat, don't you think? <laughs> <laughs> Talk about a, that tenth planet stuff, man. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Works, man. <laughs> it certainly does, mate. And and when did you transition into coaching, Brandon? Well, because of the nature of the situation I was in, I was coaching pretty early. Okay. So we opened Tenth Planet Decatur when I was a blue belt. Like there was no like like I told you, I had to go and find Eddie to learn from him. And so we just basically started building our own training partners out here. And uh, yeah, I got my blue belt. So okay, guys, come, come practice. T- it was more like come practice Tenth Planet with me than it yeah, was okay. come listen to everything I know about jujitsu. And so that was the way our school was for a long time. Was come, I'm practicing and trying to get good. Do you want to come and train hard with me? And that's really all I knew about about jujitsu. It was just I'll I'll keep trying longer than anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, eventually eventually I get my purple belt, and I'm competing along the way, right? I'm not, like, setting the world on fire, but I'm going out and doing my doing my due diligence to find out if what I'm doing is makes any sense. So I'm going out and trying to compete. So blue belt comes and goes, purple belt comes and goes, brown belt comes and goes, and then eventually, yeah, I'm a 10th planet black belt. And now I've been a black belt, I think, for the same amount of years that it took me to get my black belt, which yeah, is nice. seems crazy. Yeah, what was that moment like when you got your black belt? I felt like that was uh, a lot of stress that came off my shoulders. Yeah, I, I definitely felt like that was Eddie signing off on something that I had been working so hard for, and uh, and it was I, I sort of felt like it was him giving me permission to go do. All right, hey Brandon, you did jujitsu the way I asked you to do it. Now, go write your own songs. Let's see what you come up with. You know, uh, that's sort of the way I I felt it was licensed for me to explore jujitsu for for the very first time. Yeah, that's like in the way in the way that spoke to me the most closely. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I like the artsy part of martial arts, man. I'm kind of (laughs) dorky. Yeah, it's expressive, isn't it? Jujitsu is very expressive. Yeah, for me, for me, it's into another. It's that's the coolest part. I like being able to strangle somebody with my bare hands. That's super cool. But the coolest part for me is like the old, I like the dorky martial arts that stuff. I want to be like an old samurai in a cave one day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I love it. And mate, tell us about um, PGF. When did that sort of, uh, when did that idea pop into your head and how did that come about? That was something that we had been toying around with for several years, but really didn't know how we wanted to implement it. Um, we decided to pull the trigger in 2020 and just try to run it with just local people and see if we could flesh out the idea while nobody's paying attention. Like we didn't try to go out and get sponsors. We're just like, let's just run it on YouTube and uh, let's just do the best we can. Let's see what we can learn about about this idea because I because we think the idea is really good. We think the the idea is right. So let's just see how close we can get to the idea. And so we just decided um, to run. A full season. Yeah. Uh, (laughs) It just, we were looking for a way to make jujitsu, I don't want to say more exciting, but like more addictive, easier to watch. And for me, as I look at every other sport, it all runs on a league, like baseball league, basketball league, soccer league, football league. And everybody has always just tried to copy the basically the UFC model, which is one night event. But there's just really no chance to do story development or character development like that. And with a season, you get an opportunity to fall in love with an athlete that you feel like maybe they don't even have a chance to win this thing, but you like what they're about because you get to see them over and over and over again. 
over the course of a season. So you get to follow their highs and lows and you get to go on their emotional roller coaster with them. And to me, as I look at a season, that's what it offers that a one night event doesn't. I was like, well, we have to find a way to replicate that so that people have something to be addicted to and they have something to fall in love with. And so that's the kind of the mission that we set out on with the PGF. Yeah, it sounds like a really cool idea. Yeah, it's really cool. For, for those that are watching this and may not be massively familiar with what you're doing there at the Federation, can you just explain like in a bit more detail about kind of what a season looked like, how many athletes you've got and, and kind of how they're structured? Yeah, so we do a full week of grappling. Each athlete, we have 20 athletes. They split out into four teams. Each athlete has three matches a night for four nights in a row. The top scoring team, so the team of five, gets a hundred thousand dollars and then the top eight individuals go into a playoff on the last night and that guy gets another twenty thousand dollars if he wins in the pgf everybody gets paid no matter how well you did so we raise enough uh capital to be able to put back to the athletes thank you for coming and working this week with us even though you had a terrible week here's your paycheck (laughs) at the end of the week you know what i'm saying we're at least going to pay you for coming and being a part of it. So, you know, we're, look, we, uh, until this million dollars came up, I don't think anybody had, had ever put out the kind of prize we had put out for season six. And, you know, we're putting out four of these a year. So we're putting out over half a million dollars a year into athlete pay. And yeah, it's gone super well. It's it's picked up some crazy momentum, so it's been very it's really exciting. Cool. And is the is the kind of future plans really just to to keep doing the seasons, keep sort of growing the athletes, keep keep growing the sort of prize funds, and just make it bigger and bigger? Yeah, well the the long term mission is to have the NFL of grappling. <laughs> so maybe we Class. don't hit the level of the NFL. Obviously, like it's always going to be at least partially a niche sport. But we can have the NFL's version of that. And so I intend to build that. And the way I see the PGF is this is my love letter back to jujitsu. I'm going to do everything I can to leave legacy that changes this thing for all of us and so that everybody can keep winning moving forward. Yeah, that sounds awesome, man. And the, the individual matches, how were the, uh, what sort of rule sets you kind of worked to, to decide the outcome of the matches? So, like I said, you got 12 matches during the regular season. So here's the way the scoring works. There's no scoring for positions during the matches. It's a a six-minute match. If you, me and you are fighting, you beat me by any sort of choke, we call that a kill, that gets six points towards the playoff. You beat me by any sort of joint lock, heel hook, ankle lock, arm lock, Kimura, you're going to get, we call that a break, not a kill. That's three points towards the playoff. Any submission you get in less than a minute gets you an extra point. If we go to a draw at the end of six minutes, both of us get zero points. So you're incentivized to go for it because a draw and a loss That's are so the cool. same. Any any kill under a minute, we award the aggression with the extra point. And we award the kill over the break. So it doesn't incentivize leg locks in the same way. It encourages an older style of jujitsu in a lot of ways, of going for the neck and going for the kill. Yeah, I love that. Sounds awesome. That's really cool, isn't it? Yeah, I didn't know that. That was re- that's a really good way of doing it because, like you said, it stops people just pulling guard leg locking straight away, doesn't it? Because they want well, no, the extra it doesn't stop they it. Need it. It doesn't stop it. People still do it because you. <laughs> well, look, it's hard. It's a gamble that you're that you're making. Like, do I spend the extra energy and effort? to take a chance at six or do I take this easy three that I might see right here, a low risk three versus a high risk six. There's you're playing 12 times. Sometimes you got to, man, I need three to get back in the playoff picture. Yeah. So because it's a season, all these extra storylines come out, (laughs) all these extra pressures and strategies have to be played. And so dude, it's the most fun thing ever. We have a fantasy app. We give away money to the fans. We give away a thousand dollars to the fans this last time. So yeah, it's, it's the best dude. All the things that exist in regular sports, I'm trying to at least have a working version of that with the PGF. And then as we continue to grow, we just improve all these little parts, you know? 
Yeah, absolutely love that concept, mate. And uh, yeah, wish you all the best with it because it sounds and looks awesome. So thanks, man. Yeah, keep, keep it going, my friend. It's awesome. Um, mate, just to finish up, I just wanted to ask, obviously, you're, you're very successful on social media. Um, like prior to jujitsu, like what was your background? Were you, have you always been in media? Have you always sort of been the sort of person to, to get on socials? Like how has that been for you sort of over the last sort of few years? Well, yeah, it's a pretty crazy life that I lead right now, to be honest mm. with you. But, Looks like it. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I never really intended to do that. I really didn't. <laughs> uh, and I don't have a background in it. It just, I, I don't know. I just, uh, I guess I'm going to, love attention or something <laughs> but it's a skill set you know like learning how to run a business as a creator like that's a separate skill it's just a skill set you have to add there's things you need to know on how to set up your business and you know how to funnel traffic into the right places make how to you need to learn about multiple streams of revenue you know there's a lot of if you are an adult in 2024 you can be a you can do whatever you want and be a creator and make a living at it. It's just it's a skill set that you have to learn. Yeah, we're still on that journey at the moment, mate. So uh, we've been going with this for eighteen months. Oh yeah, just a little bit less. Sixteen, sixteen months, I think it is. Right, you're halfway to your blue belt. That's it. So we're on our way. What would um what would be your your kind of number one bit of advice for us right now, kind of being relatively new into this space to try and I guess, as you say, make a living from it. What was the biggest sort of thing that you did to, to kind of turn the corner with it? You got to you got to start storytelling. So, this a story is the only thing that everybody resonates with. Mm. So you need to master the art of storytelling, whether that's about your brand or whether that's the person you're sitting and doing interviewing with, or whether it's about the product that you're trying to sell. Or it's about the social media piece or the charity that you're pushing. You have to master storytelling if you want people to engage on any level. Like you don't want people just to watch. You want people to engage. You're looking for a thousand true fans. Who are the who are the thousand people on the planet who vibe with my brand so much that they're willing to spend a hundred dollars a year with me? If you can find those thousand people, then you got a six figure job mm -hmm. for doing what it is you wanted to do in the first place. Storytelling is how you engage those people. Great advice, mate. Thank you. And uh, Brandon, where can people find your content? If people want to engage with your businesses, like where's the best place to reach out? Just hit me up on Instagram at brandonmc.ninja. Same thing on YouTube, Brandon MC Nin I think it's just Brandon MC Ninja. And then, of course, I want you to follow PGF World on all platforms. Season 7 is coming up on UFC Fight Pass November the 3rd is when we're kicking off 205 pounds of PGF Season 7 UFC Fight Pass, November 3rd. Awesome. We'll, uh, we'll tell everybody to check that out, mate. Put your uh, links in our description, mate. But it's been an absolute pleasure, Brandon. Thank you so much for your time, my friend. Hey, thanks for inviting me. Sorry. Hey, sorry I'm so hard to get in touch with. I'm, a, I'm terrible <laughs> Honestly, to schedule with, worry, but man. you guys were patient with with the old redneck and I do appreciate it. <laughs> we'll blame the time difference, mate. It's no problem at all. <laughs> Cheers, buddy. All the best. All right. Thanks, Thank guys. You.